Hey foodies, it's Dr. Cassandra Quave here and welcome back to Foodie Pharmacology. Thanks for tuning in to listen. In this episode, I've got a really special guest, Dr. Tom Gillespie from Emory University. Last fall, Tom and I organized a special symposium with the French consulate for the France Atlanta event. We invited researchers from across the US and France to present on their work as it relates to biodiversity and human health. Human and planetary health are linked to biodiversity in ways that are not always clear or even appreciated by the public. Even as more species are disappearing in the wild and becoming threatened with extinction, others are also being introduced to new environments. This raises a lot of questions of how such environmental changes will impact our everyday life. Little did we know at the time just how prophetic the topics discussed at this symposium would be, and later as COVID emerged, likely also from a zoonotic source. I thought now would be a good time to share some of the big picture concepts discussed at the symposium and also learn more about the impact of biodiversity loss, the wildlife trade and wet markets, and the impact they have on human and planetary health. First though, let me introduce you to Dr. Gillespie. Tom Gillespie is an Associate Professor of Environmental Sciences and Environmental Health at Emory. He's an active member of the Population Biology, Ecology, and Evolutionary Biology program and is the Director of Graduate Studies for the Department of Environmental Sciences. Tom's primary research examines interactions among the anthropogenic environmental change, biodiversity, and the ecology and emergence of disease in wildlife, domestic animals, and people. His research group pursues these questions using diverse pathogen study systems within mammal metapopulations and vectors in areas experiencing distinct forms of disturbance, such as selective logging, forest fragmentation, and tourism. This effort entails a combination of epidemiology, molecular ecology, behavioral ecology, social and clinical surveys, and spatially explicit modeling systems. In addition to improving our understanding of the role of human-induced habitat changes on pathogen dynamics, this work also provides the opportunity for early detection of novel pathogens that may pose a threat to global health and or wildlife conservation. Tom also serves on the IUCN Species Survival Commission and has been elected as a fellow of the Linnaean Society of London, the world's oldest biological society. So thank you so much, Tom, for coming on the show. Um, I know you're dialing in remotely um, from uh, Chicago at the, at the moment. And I mean, it's great to be able to see you face to face over Zoom. Yeah, thanks, thanks for having me here, Cassie. Yeah. Um, looking forward to the discussion. Yeah, so I, I thought it might be good if we could start off with just a basic discussion around what is planetary health? So there are several terms that you'll hear, I think, more and more often now that people are thinking more about the interconnection between our health and the environment. And planetary health is one of those, one health is another, mm -hmm. and ecosystem health is another and all of these are ways to try to simplify something that's very complex into a packageable uh, way to bring this to the public to policymakers to really have people understand that there are important linkages between our health and the health of other species um, as well as the environments within which we all share so it's really you know having people recognize that pathogens don't recognize species boundaries. And many times environments are very important in, uh, in this process, especially if we're, if we're changing them. Yeah, so you've, you've really dedicated your career to understanding these dynamics. Maybe, could you tell us a little bit about your work, for example, in Madagascar, and, and you know, what are some of the big things that you've found in that research? Sure. So whether, whether it's Madagascar or Tanzania or Colombia, Argentina, wherever we're working, it's, it's really trying to look at the systems where we uh, see the most biodiversity um, because it's really, if we're thinking about where we're going to see disease emergence, the places where it's most probable is where we have high levels of biodiversity. So we study those systems. 
And we study those systems either in the process of change where selective logging is happening or the habitat is being fragmented uh, for agricultural production, either commercial or small scale. Uh, and looking at how that alters the interaction of the species, um, the natural species uh, in that system, as well as how it might create novel behavioral interchanges between us and those species, or even with our, our domesticated animals as intermediaries, whether it's livestock or dogs uh, and so on. Yeah, I think that's probably one of the biggest misconceptions that humans have when it comes to their perception of a relationship with nature is we kind of think of ourselves as being outside of nature and not a part of it and isolated from it when in fact we're very much intertwined with with these natural systems and as you mentioned you know pathogens don't always distinguish between one host and another um what have been some of the biggest uh factors that you've seen that have contributed towards human interactions with nature and biodiversity loss? Well, so within the systems, again, where we have most of the biodiversity, those, those tropical forest systems, uh, the primary drivers of loss of, uh, of those systems has been agriculture, uh, mm -hmm. large-scale industrial agriculture. Um, whether it's uh, oil palm plantations or soy production, it's large-scale production of commodities um, that, are, that are basically becoming more and more in demand because of two, two factors. Um, we, as a species, have doubled our population in less than 50 years. And in that same time, we've gone from being a primarily rural species to a predominantly urban species mm -hmm. and that has led to a disconnect of what you're speaking of you know that we're seeing ourselves as separate from nature that's part of it um also urban dwellers are really starting to drive the patterns of food consumption and what people are deciding to eat in cities is is actually altering landscape uh use and land land change in these tropical environments so as more people want to have more animal protein in their diet, as more people want to have fried foods in their diet, there's a search for uh, places where they can grow the, the goods that are needed for animal feed, like soy, mm -hmm. uh, and the things that provide for the low cost uh, options for frying oils, like, uh, like oil palm and, and soy as well. Wow. Yeah, it's hard to imagine, you know, when you make that choice of what you're going to cook for lunch or for dinner, it's hard to imagine that that choice has an impact in some cases on the other side of the world. Um, um, yeah. the, so I, Brazil is a, a major producer of soy, um, but it's important to remember that 25% of that soy production impact that's happening in the deforestation associated with it mm -hmm. is to supply for the European Union market, for example. Really? Yeah. And a lot of these, as you mentioned, are not purely for human consumption, but rather as animal feed. And again, fueling the consumption of large amounts of, of meat proteins across the globe. Yeah. And then the after, after those drivers of, you know, soy and oil palm, uh, the next largest driver is actually beef production itself mm -hmm. uh, or pasture, pasture-raised beef in, in tropical systems. Yeah. So our food, the choices we make are, are really directly linked to some of these patterns of land use change where spillover of pathogens is an unintended consequence of that, that land conversion process. Yeah. So when you speak about land conversion, can you paint a picture of this? Let's say that we're in a tropical forest, perhaps let's use Brazil as an example. What does the land conversion process look like of going from a forested environment to a beef cattle farming enterprise? So you can go through sequential stages in the process, uh, or you can do just an all out transition. Um, so the, the case that we see oftentimes like for soy production in Brazil would be a sequential process where you're logging an area, um, you're profiting from that process of, of logging it. And in many cases, that forest, the, the timber, is a positive externality for whoever's logging it. They didn't have to pay for 
the process of creating that bio, biomass that's then being converted uh, to timber. Um, so that's uh, a win-win for the, those cutting it if we don't impose a cost on that mm -hmm. um, at some level. And then after that, you could have a production of some crop uh, for a few years without a lot of inputs, just from the, the carbons that have been brought through, uh, freeing up that space. But then in tropical systems, often you can't have uh, long-term use of the soils without heavy, heavy inputs of fertilizers and, and then pesticides to be able to deal with tropical pests. Yeah. Uh, species. And so um, after a while, this can, gets converted to pasture. And then you basically can, can have cattle production in those areas. The, the alternative to that is if you look at what happens with oil palm, uh, if you think about Borneo, uh, where we've seen tremendous uh, uh, upscale of this process, it's typically a burning of the forest. And that burning process you know, has tremendous impacts on uh, global carbon stores and uh, air quality and many factors at the same time that you're, you're in the process uh, leaving some carbon from that process for, uh, for the plantation that will come next. And so they burn the, the area and then they plant the, the, the oil palm trees. Yeah, well and this has a tremendous impact not only on, um, on kind of human systems, but also that of primates and other animals. I, I had the opportunity a number of years ago to travel to Sumatra and visited some of the, um, one of the orangutan sanctuaries because their habitats have been so incredibly fragmented through um, planting of oil palms in the region. Um, can you tell us a bit more about impact of these, of these um, large agribusiness kind of initiatives? What impacts those have on local wildlife? And I know you um, work a lot with primates. Maybe we could start there. Yeah, I mean, so, with, with a lot of these activities, it's, it's basically a complete removal of the forest. And so those animals no longer have a place to live. Um, with the primates, that typically doesn't bode well because they can try to move into other areas, but they're already going to be resident individuals of their species. And they're gonna start competing with those individuals for resources uh, and mates. And so it doesn't tend to work out very well. And that's been one of the challenges with the sanctuaries for the orangs, there's nowhere for them to go. Mm -hmm. So they have so many orangs and they want to be able to reintroduce them. But if they're reintroducing them into the few remaining forests and those are already at capacity, um, you're basically just creating more competition and you'll end up not increasing densities in those areas. You'll just cause a pretty painful process for the animals involved in that competition. Uh, the, other, the other challenge is that in some areas where these plantations are going in, people are hunting those wild primates as part of the process. You know, it's easier for them in a remote area to hunt locally than to bring in food from outside. Mm -hmm. so sometimes part of their pay might even be in uh, bullet casings or, uh, you know, some some other way to be able to hunt in those areas, uh, whether it's with snares or, or with guns. And uh, we know that some of the important diseases that have emerged from wild primates to people uh, emerged through that process of people hunting and then butchering uh, wild primates. Uh, so HIV being you know, the, the most important in that regard. But we also have examples of that with apes being exposed to Ebola from uh, a reservoir and then people being exposed via the ape uh, when butchering them. Wow, wow. Well, and now we, I know that there's been reports in the news also that um, primates may also be at risk from the coronavirus. Um, can you speak a little bit to that? So we're not only seeing transmission of disease from, from one direction, but also back in the other direction. Yeah, so in this case, I mean, it's, it's such a crazy world that you have, you know, the impacts in the tropics leading to global pandemics that can then come back to the tropics in a, in a different way and impact different species. So the, the unfortunate situation for the wild primates is that as our closest relatives, when we're susceptible to something, they're often susceptible as well. 
And we've seen this with a number of respiratory pathogens before with the wild apes, where we've had, you know, even things that cause the common cold in people uh, have caused mortality events in multiple ape species at multiple sites. Um, so we're really concerned about uh, the COVID-19 pandemic in that same way, especially since the SARS-CoV-2 virus that's causing uh, the disease um, has a receptor uh, compatibility uh, for humans that we also see in a number of these, what we call catarine uh, primates, the, the apes and the old world monkeys. Um, they're all susceptible uh, as far as we can tell. And other primates uh, have greater um, similarities in that receptor within their, within their genome compared to a lot of other species. So the question is kind of at what level will we see susceptibility beyond the old world monkeys and the apes, but we're extremely concerned with, uh, with those species, especially um, the ones that are more terrestrial, that come to the ground, and they're the ones that will have the greatest overlap. Yeah. Wow. Well, I know that there, there are some terms that have been circulating um, in the news also around wet markets. Yeah. And yeah. wet markets, I think, can have a number of different meanings. Wet markets don't always include wildlife trade, but in many cases they do. I know from my travels, I've seen, I've been in many such markets where you have primates in cages or reptiles in cages and, um, or other live animals that are um, there for sale because, you know, there's not necessarily refrigeration, especially in these tropics for selling fresh meat. And so they're sold um, as, you know, as live animals. I've also seen, you know, hunting practices in a number of places where I've worked, um, you know, of, of hunting wildlife for food by local people. And that definitely puts hunters at a different level of exposure than you would have um, through our traditional kind of Western meat acquisition of getting something that's pre, pre butchered and plastic wrapped, you know? So I wonder if maybe we could talk a bit about this around wet markets and wildlife trade. And maybe can you tell us a bit about like just how large or how how prominent is the global wildlife trade for food? And is this something more that's done by kind of small scale local consumption? Or is this also spreading to a larger kind of global distribution? So the it's it's very different depending on where you're at in the world. And as you were saying, you know, in many ways, we're quite disconnected from the fact that we're part of the natural world. Um, the, the way that people in the Western world approach food in this kind of very sterile, disconnected way, I think it's part of the, the misunderstanding of sort of how people around the world are connecting with nature through their food, whether it's medicine or the link between, you know, food being medicine, like related to your work, but also the diversity of, of animals uh, that, that would go into a potential diet. And it's very different depending on where you are, how reliant people are on those natural sources of, uh, of animal protein, uh, and how much of it is coming from terrestrial systems versus you know, the oceans. Uh, Westerners tend to have not much of a problem thinking about the oceans in this way. If you think about people and their love of sushi and, you know, it's, it's interesting to me that there's not that same kind of disconnect. And actually, you know, that's a really good point. I mean, when, when I go to the market with my kids, their favorite place to go is the, the, the seafood area where they have the live fish and the live crabs kind of crawling around on top of each other in this, you know, what, so in a sense, I already do shop at a wet market, just not. Um, and I'm sure you had a similar, I mean, feeling of awe the first time you went into one of these more dynamic markets, mm -hmm. you know, tropics. I'm thinking of some of the markets that you and I have both been in, like in, in uh, you know, at the, at the front row there uh, in Iquitos. And the oh, yeah, the Balin market. Yeah, the float. <laughs> um, you know, species, you know, live primates. And, and there's, there's an excitement to seeing the diversity but then at the same time, it's sinking into all the connections between, you know, conservation issues and issues of potential disease and, and so on. So yeah, it's a great window into understanding kind of 
for me, plant diversity in the area, like what plants are being traded, what plants are, are locally found. And, and for you, who's more interested in, in kind of the animal trade, it's got to be fascinating. Yeah. So we, we were, when you think about these wet markets, you have the trade of live animals. You also have hunters that are, um, you know, hunting wildlife for food. I've seen on many occasions, um, especially in, in the Amazon, it's very common to hunt adult primates and then keep the young as kind of a pet for the family. I've seen this and, you know, it's kind of, you, you give the baby monkey to the daughter in the household and it's kind of like her baby doll toy she raises for a while. When it's old enough, they then eat it. And there's a different kind of connection with, um, with wildlife as a source of food. But again, this also opens up opportunities for disease transmission. So maybe we could talk about that. I know you have a number of models and um, projects that evaluate these dynamics of disease transmission. Yeah, so that's, that's a really important point. So one point of potential risk is when people are butchering the animal uh, and having that blood to blood contact. Um, or, you know, exposure to any of the bodily fluids that could lead to transmission dynamics. Uh, and then the second is this kind of close, intimate contact uh, that's either by choice, in, as in the case of taking on the, the baby monkey as a pet, keeping it in the house. It's going out into the system around the house, interacting with uh, other species. In, in many cases, people may have dogs but they're hunting dogs and they're not brought in to the family life in the way that the monkey is. So it's very different from maybe the way you might have a, a pet dog at home. Mm -hmm. where the dog's not ever entering the house, but the monkey is. Yeah. And the monkey could actually transfer something to you from the dogs or from some other species that you may not be interacting with directly. Uh, so that's another important component of it. Uh, and then we have the unwanted interaction of the peridomestic species, the rats and the mice. And that's a really common phenomena in the systems where we work as well. People don't have the capacity to protect their food reserves as well as we might have uh, here. So they're often losing agricultural uh, yield to these pests. And then they're also losing some of the food they're storing for long-term use to these pests. And this is, of course, the classic story of, of the, you know, of, of the bubonic plague in Europe and disease transmission through Absolutely. rodents. So, the, so those, those rodents can act as uh, intermediate host mm -hmm. uh, or the pathogen, or they can actually contaminate the food supply with their urine and feces and directly uh, transmit to you uh, some of these things. So there's a, we're hearing a lot about um, you know, COVID-19 right now as the, the big pandemic that's happening, but we also have an epidemic uh, occurring of loss of fever in West Africa mm. that's linked to land use change uh, as they develop more large scale uh, palm oil production in that region um, in multiple countries, in Nigeria, Sierra Leone, Sierra Leone and so on. Um, and where the rodents, natural rodent species that had been living in the forest, now that the forest is gone, have moved into the homes of nearby oh, wow. where people are becoming exposed through contamination. And can you just give us a, a very brief description of what loss of fever is? What are the symptoms of that? So it's, uh, it's a febrile illness that can end up as a, a hemorrhagic fever. So can be, you know, really high mortality rates. You can have mortality rates over, well over 20%. Um, and so, it's, it's a big, big issue. Uh, and you can have, this is like basically repeated wildlife to human exposure causing this. Wow. And then what about how, how these kind of industrial expansions of monocropping, of, of, of growing single types of crops at a large scale, that also I'm, I'm, I'm imagining impacts local economies and how local people and you know, engage with the environment for their work. So does that also put them at more risk, not just the animals coming out of, you know, losing their territory and having more contact with people, but also people going in and clearing these forests or working in these um, engineered forests? Is that also a, a big issue? 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very common for people in intact tropical forest systems, uh, if they're large scale, to be very dependent on that natural resource base. Mm-hmm. And so people are often not very integrated into the cash economy. They're getting their, their foods, their medicines, their clean water, all the things that we often refer to as environmental services or ecosystem services, they're, they're relying on those. Um, I mean, we all are. All of our economies, all of our lives are based on those. Again, we tend to ignore those connections, mm-hmm. but they, they can't because they don't have anything to fall back on. And so in many of those areas, people are at relatively low density um, or they're living in traditional ways. And because of that, they're not going to have the same ability to organize to fight that process of change. Um, So you get into human rights related issues, indigenous rights uh, in a lot of these areas where uh, it's very complex and and challenging. So moving forward, Tom, what are some of the major things that scientists um, should be looking at when it comes to understanding these planetary and human health dynamics? So a a really important part of this is improving our surveillance for these things. So right now you're hearing a lot in the media about bats and rodents and primates as really important potential sources. Um, You're hearing about rodents because there are a lot of them. So if you think about mammals, they're the most similar uh, species to us because we're all mammals. Um, That's where you're going to see the greatest potential for the ease of transmission of a path. There are just a, you know, a little over 5,000 species of mammals. Half of those are rodents. Um, and just so by a numbers game, that's a really important place to be looking because diversity begets diversity. And so diversity of pathogens is going to be basically scaling with overall diversity. Uh, and then on top of that, we have some species where there are unique aspects of their physiology that make them even more important than just their their numbers in terms of how important it is to look at them as potential sources. And bats fit into that scenario. So Mm -hmm. bats are also quite speciose among mammals. Uh, They account for between 20 and 25%. We can't put an exact number because we're we're still finding new species. Wow. Um, But in tropical systems, those most diverse systems, sometimes they account for 50% of the mammalian biodiversity. So uh, that's where we see the the greatest extent of niches for bats and and the greatest bat species diversity. In addition to their numbers, bats are important uh, to think about in terms of spillover potential because their metabolism is unique uh, and, and their capacity for flight is unique. So they're the only truly flying mammal. And being able to do that requires Uh, a lot of special characteristics, which also alter their immune function, which means their their basal uh, body temperature is higher than we see in other mammals, and it creates a unique environment for viruses where it may be easier for the virus to persist, but without causing a lot of damage to that host. Oh, interesting. So... And then thirdly, primates are really important because they are, even though there are a lot fewer, there are you know, just over 200 species of primates, they are the species most closely related to us. So it takes the least evolutionary change for a virus to become what it would need to be to, to do well in humans. Wow. Yeah, and you really hit on something important with, with bats and their mobility And they also play such a big role in in the health of many ecosystems in terms of being pollinators for a number of of plant species and also helping with controlled insect populations. I mean, so it's, we don't want to put this out that bats are not just, you know, disease vectors. They are incredibly important parts of, of ecosystems. And so what would monitoring disease emergence look like? Are we talking about taking samples of feces or are more invasive techniques needed like blood draws? How does this work? So so there's quite a bit we can do from fecal material, but we do need to do blood draws for a lot of these things to be able to rapidly do this. And we can do this without causing, uh, you know, without killing animals. We can do this where we can take the sample and then release them. And, And there have been a lot of kind of opportunistic uh, processes through various 
you know, agencies and entities to try to do surveillance. Um, you may have heard of PREDICT. This is a USAID funded effort to do this. WHO has had a number of efforts, but they've, they tend to have been very opportunistic and haphazard where there's not a really strong research design and hypothesis driven approach to this and where it's not integrated well with human surveillance. So what you really want is one health platform where you're, you're concurrently doing human sampling, wildlife sampling, uh, domesticated and peridomestic animal sampling, as well as getting more of the ecological uh, supplemental data that you would need to really look at that interface. Uh, and that's what we want to see more of. Um, that's what what's really needed. So that, that haphazard approach that's been used thus far, as I said, there aren't that many species of mammals. Um, we've only screened about 10% of mammal species for potential zoonoses for humans. Wow. So we really need an organized global initiative to, to keep track of, of, this, of these diseases, especially since there's so many more opportunities now across the globe with greater, you know, opportunities for interaction between humans and, and these um, wildlife. Exactly. And so the, you know, surveillance is really, really important to really have a better understanding of what's out there. Um, and that helps us to start the process of creating vaccines for things we expect. Mm -hmm. um, and also to have a sense of the magnitude of variability among some of these uh, viral groups and other non-viral pathogen groups. Um, the other really important thing is, again, like you were saying, these are really critical species in terms of a number of ecosystem services. So bats, primates, uh, and rodents are all playing critical roles, as well as many other species. But the ones that you know people are most concerned about for spillover, we can't just get rid of them. Yeah. Um, you know that would that would doom us in terms of our economies, which are highly dependent on pollination and and other processes mm -hmm. from you know rodent or uh, basically uh, pest control as well is another major service that's provided. Um, flying insects, uh, malaria control, and other. Mm -hmm control via bats. So all of these things would be lost and the process of us trying to hunt them down and get rid of them is exactly what we would do if we wanted to cause a spillover in the first place. <laughs> exactly. We would maximize the chance of a spillover uh, and not one spillover but many in succession. Yeah. So. so if you could envision your dream global task force, um, what would that look like and you know, I think, how could we better connect environmental monitoring with proactive health measures, as you mentioned, in terms of getting ahead of the curve on generating vaccine prototypes, you know, in case we do have spillover events? Like, what would that look like in an ideal world without funding limitations? I mean, a, a big, big part of it is really about not siloing health and environment. That's a really big part of it because there has been this tradition of keeping environmental factors over here and health factors over here. And I think part of that is that infectious disease has tended to be far less important in developed countries where many of the policy drivers have been happening uh, for the past hundred years. And so it's been on the back burner where, you know, West Nile virus and Lyme disease are the things you hear about when you hear about infectious disease here, or you hear about the influenza seasonal uh, outbreak. Um, but those are very minor players relative to, you know, causes of mortality and reduced uh, quality of life in the, in the United States and Europe and, and other developed countries. When you go to developing countries, infectious disease is very common and, and is something that is a major cause of mortality and, and reduced quality of life. And so the, the global health movement is very aware of that connection. Mm -hmm. uh, and the linkages to environment are becoming more and more clear. But I think we need kind of at all levels, uh, this interface to to be strengthened um, to have people working together on these things um, and we all know it costs money to do these things and that's one of the weird things with this siloing effect is that they've created this place right in the middle where there's very little funding available 
So yeah. there, it's very hard to find funding to be able to work on understanding disease dynamics in wildlife. So you know, if you're going to create a study that is specifically looking at a pathogen because we're quite sure it's going to jump into people and then you can basically talk about it as a human disease issue, then you can fund it through NIH. But to do anything more nuanced where you're still trying to understand the complex dynamic in nature, which is one of the most important things we need to do if we're gonna stop spillover, yeah. that kind of falls outside of NIH's typical peer review. And they have a very small program between NSF and NIH that funds you know, a handful of projects per year uh, that's at that interface. And for the listeners, just, just to define those acronyms, NIH is the U.S.'s National Institute of Health and NSF is the National Science Foundation. I can tell you that some of the things that I find most alarming is when you have political um, pundits or even um, political um, leaders that question the utility of funding projects in other countries. Um, and I think this this has really shown why it's so important to understand disease dynamics, not only in the U.S., but we are in a glo- we're in a global economy. We're constantly moving goods, animals, and people um, across borders all the time. And so something that may start in a remote province of a tropical forest um, could be, you know, in New York City within a few months um, or less. And can have tremendous impact. I, I hope that of, of anything that this lesson comes across, that, that we need to have better monitoring and better proactive action when it comes to understanding these dynamics. Um, and that, that also stresses the need for international collaboration absolutely. at all levels. Uh, yeah. So even in terms of like vaccine, uh, you know, when you're actually working out how you're going to create a vaccine, that requires tremendous amounts of trust and collaboration between different countries uh, and data sharing. And so, yeah. no, that's that's key. Is is yeah? It's it's we are we are now at a point in history where you know the only way I think to be successful is to approach these issues from a global perspective. Um, We've seen a lot around One Health in the area of antibiotic resistance already as well. I think we can see lots of good examples from that where we have, you know, the rise of antibiotic resistance because of chronic use of of antibiotics as growth promoters and um, enabling us to to basically grow um, and house these animals in very, very tight quarters, which is, of course, the perfect place for diseases to emerge by trying to, to reduce that disease burden, we're also then fostering um, the rise of antibiotic-resistant pathogens that then, you know, data has shown over and over have passed over into humans. And so this concept of being separate from animals, whether they're livestock or wild animals, is, is, is just not correct. We are very much entangled <laughs> and need to uh, better, better understand these relationships. And that, that link to antibiotics has helped us to be able to see just how easy it is for us to transfer things indirectly to wildlife. So we've, we've actually looked at the movement of antibiotic-resistant uh, bacteria into wildlife populations to get a sense of when transmission occurs and where it occurs, because they're not actually being exposed to antibiotics typically. And so when we see uh, you know, high prevalence of resistant bacteria in their populations, it gives us a sense of, of where exposure is coming from. Wow. Yeah. And so, Tom, what would be your message to the students, to undergraduates and graduate students, or even, you know, kids in elementary school or high school that are interested in environmental studies or interested in understanding this link between humans and nature and like, what advice would you give them as, as they kind of explore this area? I think the most important thing to remember is whatever you're passionate about, whatever you're excited about, it relates to this. Mm-hmm. Because the, the global economy, our, our, our existence is dependent on natural processes. And we're part of that natural process. And whether you're, you know, just absolutely passionate about food, you know, 
that we've talked a lot today about that component and how on all these different levels you could be engaged in this process. You know, what's driving deforestation that's leading to spillover? You know, it's the fact that we're clearing more land for specific commodities to be grown. We can make choices, you know, if everyone uh, was reducing their intake of animal protein and, and fried foods to what, what is recommended by the World Health Organization, simply from a health perspective, yeah. that would get us a lot closer to where we need to be. Because yeah, that's, that's a really good point. Driving this pattern is overconsumption of animal protein and overconsumption of fried foods in developed and developing countries. And so that's, that's one part of it. Another is food waste. You know, people are starting to recognize that in developed nations, there's so much food waste, so much uh, lack of efficiency and, you know, having uh, a, a, a full circle in the process of dealing with those products. Um, and then another is, you know, how we approach our agriculture. Can we do this in a more resilient way? And there's, there's more of a focus on that as well. So even within thinking about food, there are so many different ways you can think about this. And then, you know, if your passion is related to the conservation of a specific species, you can start to learn about that species and what the specific threats to them are. And there are always innovative solutions. Um, there's a group called Conservation X Labs. I don't know if you've heard of them, but they're organizing an event uh, th this week for Earth Day with the Smithsonian. Um, which is focused on earth optimism. And the idea is to come up with innovative solutions to specific problems. And so there are a lot of scientists working with uh, student teams to help them to develop ideas for technological solutions or policy solutions to some of these key, key issues. That's great, Tom. Wow. Well, I'm going to leave it on that optimistic note um, that everyone has the power to make smart choices that can be friendly, not only to your personal health, but also to the planet's health. Um, and this was great. And thank you for all the work that you do and for sharing this knowledge with us. It was really interesting. Thank you as well, Cassie, and, and for all that you do. I'm Dr. Cassandra Quave, and you've been listening to Foodie Pharmacology, the science podcast for the food curious, recorded on Zoom from home during the COVID-19 isolation period. You can subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts or SoundCloud. We've got an amazing lineup of topics and shows for you this season, so be sure to mark your calendars because new episodes are coming out every single Monday. Also, help me out by sharing links to your favorite episodes with your friends. Um, we're trying to reach more people and build up the foodie pharmacology audience. If you like the show, please also leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts. Thanks so much for listening. Stay healthy out there, and I'll see you next time.